though many countries attempt it in some way or the other way, but in vain. Now, I, it's uh, really happy that United Nations has come out with a nat nature-based solution to disasters as well as climate change. Let us hear it from the horse's mouth itself. I'm happy, I'm happy that we have here Dr. Murali Tumarugudi, the operations manager of crisis management branch at United Nations Environmental Program, Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Karen Suramir Ru, senior advisor, disaster risk reduction with United Nations Environment Program, again, disasters and conflicts program, Geneva, Switzerland. And also we have, we are, have, we are released to have Ms. Devashri Pillai, the project support, United Nations Environment Program, Oil for Development Partnership, again, Geneva in Switzerland. I, on behalf of Sacred Heart College and myself, all heartedly welcome you all. No I, welcome, I welcome our principal, Dr. Father, Dushant, Pali Kepil, CMI also. I also welcome all the participants who have joined for this particular special webinar. Now, let me right away invite our Dr. Dushant, Pali Kepil, CMI, to take over the technical session and uh, continue with our father, please. Uh, dear Dr. Murli, dear team from the UNEP, and also Dr. James and uh, uh, Dr. Juno, all my team members and all other students and all others who are attending this session. A warm namaskaram to all of you. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Very pleased to have this session. Uh, it is a dream come true like uh, we had a great opportunity to associate with the UN uh, Environment Program by attending a workshop uh, regarding ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. And I think it was a very insightful program. I thank uh, the UN for the opportunity. And it is thanks to that uh, experience that we thought of having a program, uh, a short course based on the UN uh, curriculum itself at the, as an open course for the undergraduate students. It is also offered as an add-on program uh, for open to all, and I hope that over the years it will become much more established. And I'm very grateful to the uh, team under Dr. Murli and Karen for having uh, agreed to associate with us and help us out today to give inputs from their own uh, great experience, vast and rich experience, and also provide a certificate from the UN to the participants. I don't, I didn't do well much on this because um, I just wanted to say thanks uh, regarding this thing, this opportunity, and we look forward to many more opportunities to join hands with uh, the UN uh, regarding this very vital, and very uh, important uh, area uh, regarding the phenomenon of nature-based uh, and natural um, natural uh, disaster, so to say, uh, which we face and how we get to them. Thank you and welcome all of Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Um, I, I would now start the technical session. I, I want to thank um, Sacred Heart College uh, and Father Prashant in particular uh, for following upon the in initial uh, discussion we had. We had somebody whose uh, microphone is on. So if you could please mute it, then you will not get the background noise. Um, so uh, as um, Dr. James said, I'm Murali Tumarugudi. For those who are in uh, from Kerala, you know me because during every natural disaster, I appear um, with various sort of advices and suggestions. And it is a pleasure for me to talk to you, to the young people um, and the researchers. I can actually see some um, researchers have joined, including from Meerut and other places. 
I'm very delighted um, to um, talk to you. The course which uh, is currently offered by the Sacred Heart College is a full course. It's upon 40 hours of lecture. So we therefore do not intend to cover all that in just one hour. Also, we want to give maximum opportunity to the students. To ask Hello. questions. So I would. Uh, I, can we just check whose mic is on and then ask them to switch off, please? One is Anjana. Anjana, please switch off. Thank you. <laughs> Not it. So what I will try to do today is to give you some concepts about ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction and help you to answer a few questions. That's all what I will try to do today. So the few questions which I will try to answer today Number one, are disasters increasing? Number two, is climate change causing new disasters? Number three, are disasters preventable? Number four, what are the linkages between ecosystems and disaster risk? Then I will talk about some international best practices, some global framework opportunities for Kerala. And finally, I conclude with what additional information, what opportunities are there for you to learn, and so on. So you all hear about a lot more disasters um, these days. Now, some people argue that this is because we are in a lot more interconnected world, that we hear a lot more about disasters happening anywhere in the world. For example, in the past, 100 years back, if there's a small flood in the middle of Africa, people in Travancore or Kochi or in India would not know about it. But that's not the case now. We come to here very fast. And some type of disasters, such as earthquake, all the geological disasters, they do not increase with time. But it is evident that some type of disasters, and you can see the, the graph of 1980 to 2018, you can already see a very significant increase in the number of disasters. And those disasters are primarily linked to climate-linked action. So it could be a rain, a drought, a forest fire, a cyclone, and so on. So clearly, there's an increase in the number of disasters. And the question then is that why is that the disaster, disasters are increasing? Now, a disaster happened not because there is a hazard such as a cyclone or an earthquake. Disasters happen because of three separate factors. Number one, naturally, is the hazard. So that could be a flood, a landslide, cyclone, drought, tsunami. So that's one element of the disaster. The second is exposure, which means that if you have a tsunami in a coastline where nobody is living, then of course that won't turn into a disaster. It will turn to a huge wave, which hit the coast and went back in 15 minutes. So to, for an event to turn into a disaster, you not only need a hazard, but also should have an exposure to it of human, of some human property, or natural environment. And the third one is that those resources which are exposed should also be vulnerable. For example, we had an earthquake in Haiti in 2010 January. If I remember, it was 10th of January. The magnitude was just 7.1. Yet 
216,000 people died in one minute in that earthquake. 216,000 people died. A month later, there was an earthquake in Chile, which had a magnitude which was almost 500 times that in Haiti. But the number of people who died was less than 500. And that's because in Chile, the buildings were built to last an earthquake, which was not the case in Haiti. And this is exactly what happens in Japan when earthquakes happen. So it's not that if you have hazard and exposure, it will turn into disaster. It can also turn into disaster when the individuals, institutions, or structures are not designed to last that disaster. And here I come to the impact of climate change. Is climate change bringing new disasters into our midst? And the answer is no, climate change is not bringing any new disaster. Climate change is not causing something which we never knew. Of course, climate change is causing disasters in new places. Kerala, for example, was never considered a place where cyclones used to come. Cyclone used to be in the Bengal, it used to be in the Pacific, it used to be in the Atlantic, while we never had it. But in 2017, we had Oki. So we are now starting to see disasters which we have had elsewhere coming into our areas. Climate change is making disasters much bigger. So if you had rains, you are getting more rain. If you had a wind, you are getting heavier wind. If you had a drought, you are getting longer droughts. So climate change is expanding, magnifying the size of the disaster. And so is development. So the reason why the natural disaster in 2018, the flood had much more impact, 32,000 crores of impact compared to the, the flood of 1924 was because we had a lot more development in the meanwhile. So in 1924, uh, the, the flood of 99, let's say in the areas which are impacted, if 10% of all the motor cars were washed off by the flood, we would have lost probably three cars. But if the same flood happened in the same place and same 10% of cars got washed out in 2018, we would lose 300,000 cars because we had a lot more affluence at that time. So as much as climate change is magnifying, disaster development is also magnifying disasters. The third point is about how environment and disasters are linked. The first one is very obvious, and we have seen it all over, that environmental degradation is simply leading to natural disasters. Landslide is a prime example. So this picture I took from Haiti. So you have deforestation, which lead to landslides. But the opposite is also a huge substorm or a tsunami can completely destroy you know, a coral reef. Or a massive tsunami could wipe out the entire um, coastal forest. So the, it worked both ways. Normal degradation lead to disasters, and disasters lead to a normal degradation. This is where the role of ecosystems come in. So ecosystems can act at the three levels of the disaster equation. It can prevent hazards, such as changing the potential to have a landslide, for example. Reduce exposure as acting as a barrier. The image which you see is a sand dune from Sri Lanka. And wherever there was a sand dune like that, the impact of tsunami behind it was much less pronounced. And ecosystems, healthy ecosystem, can also reduce vulnerability because people have access to resources and they can recover much faster. This example which I said, so they had two resorts, one behind the dune. In another place, they removed the dune because it was obstructing the view 
and in the end that destroyed the resort during the last august disaster in kerala we had a lot of talk about the forest uh, in switzerland so when landslide happened in the high ranges all the way from wayna to idiki people started talking about the idea of the protection forest in switzerland so i wanted to show you a picture this is a town called davos and this is where the world economic forum is held and for 100 years this town used to have massive landslides uh, massive landslides and avalanches every year and dozens of people used to die so they decided that from the top of the hill till the place where people live they will plant a forest and will not allow people to cut that forest and that's how this forest came in regardless of whose land it is the forest is protected by the department of forestry and now davos is one of the safest place and it is the heart of winter the peak of winter that the world leaders prime ministers and president come there for the world economic forum fully safe you may have also heard about the project called room for the river which is a dutch model on how to prevent flood by managing the river in rest of the world where it's not a river situation it is called making space for water the logic is that a disaster happens a flood happened because the water has nowhere to go so if we can create more space for water to expand then it will not result in a flood there are many ways in which we could create that situation for example and i will share all, all these slides so even if you can't see now you can lower the flood plain so you have the water has no more space to go you can deepen the river flow you can move the side barriers to both sides and so on so there are many ways in which you can create additional water channels and so on and so forth now this is the type of technique which will be appropriate in kerala especially in place like kutnad or the coal lands of trichur where we have created artificial barriers and the water has no place to go and that creating flood situation there but by doing this we can actually remove uh, the flood impact because the water will have lot more place to go and this is also particularly important i think meera's microphone is on and is causing a lot of disturb disturbance so meera if you could please switch off meera thank you so in a place like kochi where you already have water logging and due to climate change this is going to increase massively if you go to website called climate central they have predicted which areas in the world in the next 50 years would be fully waterlogged and part of kochi is there and people are living in those areas now if you do not make room for the water people will not be able to live there so you will have to either raise the house which many people are doing but that's a battle which you will not win or create space for water so you will have to necessarily create lot more open areas in kochi for the water to expand so that other part of kochi can have a normal life this is this one tree in japan uh, is is in a place called rikasen takada they had a japan had a culture of planting trees all along the beach they had pine trees all along the beach and the reason was to prevent people from staying there and creating a barrier between a tsunami and the people and in this location they had 70000 trees and only one tree survived so now that tree is revered and people are praying for it and uh, they they raised more than 1 million dollar to protect that tree uh, and now after the tsunami 
Japan has decided that they would move all the habitation much behind a tree line and a water line, water dike, and so on and so forth. So again, nature-based solution. But before you start to think that for every solution, every problem, every disaster, we can have a natural solution. I must say that, no, that's not the case. That in some cases, you cannot have any easy natural solution. So you will need other physical solutions as well. So nature-based solution or an ecosystem-based solution should not be seen as an exclusive, all-inclusive solution for this. There are international conventions which deals with disasters. And those who you who study disaster risk reduction may have studied this. It's called ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. Um, this is called the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And this is currently applicable 2015 to 2030. And that has factored in the ecosystems approach. These are some of the projects which you are doing just to demonstrate that the ecosystem-based approach has a role, whether it's a coastline or a hill, or a river plain or a desert. So it's not that it cannot be done in one ecosystem or the other, or rich country or poor country. All type of countries, not only Switzerland, but also Sudan can have that type of solution. We also do ecosystem-based um, projects in Kerala. We are working with the Kerala Institute of Local Administration, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, and we are also working with, um, of course, the Second Heart College to introduce this course. And we hope this is a new world of online learning. In a year or two, all over India, people will be able to study the course offered by Second Heart College and get credit for this. We also have a series of publications. I will share this PowerPoint with you on this topic. We have two books, number of publications, extremely interesting. We have an organization called PEDER, Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction. We have a weekly newsletter on the topic. We have a new online course coming for which you will get more information. And we have a global network of more than 15,000 people. And I encourage all of you to join this um, say, uh, network to continue to have access to this information. Thank you. I can now invite Devasri to um, give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Murali. I will upload my presentation. Just one moment. Can you please confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can see. We can see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. What I will be doing today would be taking you through the gender perspectives that we have to keep in mind while we speak about disaster and climate change. So our main question for today is: Does gender really matter in the face of disasters and climate change? Since I'm giving this presentation today, the answer is yes. Generally, when we think about nature. We consider it to be this giant equalizer, which does not care for whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're rich or poor. And that nature in itself does not discriminate. It is we who discriminate and our institutions which discriminate. So if you take any person, you can place them on the axis of different inequalities they face. Just because someone is a man does not mean they do not face political inequalities or socioeconomic inequalities. And just because a woman is rich does not mean she does not face inequities in the nature of gender bias. So today, what I will try to do is take you through the consequences of gender bias planning and try to make a case for why gender mainstreaming is relevant, both in our disaster management and also in climate change adaptation measures. In 2007, a research was conducted uh, looking at a large number of disasters over a long period of time. And the two main findings were that one, the stronger a disaster is, the more severe is impact on the female life expectancy. In fact, women and children are 14 times more likely to die in disasters than men are. 
And another one of their findings, equally significant, which reflects upon the multiple vulnerabilities of people and groups, is that the adverse impact of these disasters on females related to men do vanish with the rising socioeconomic status of women. To put it uh, in very simple terms, a rich woman and a poor man might face certain challenges which might be skewed in favor of one and against one in circumstances depending on where they are placed in the socioeconomic and political structure of society. To give you some figures as to how uh, skewed this may be is that in the 1991 cyclone, 91% of who died were women. Indian Ocean tsunami, 70 to 80% women. The cyclone Nargis in Myanmar of 2008, 61% women. The Great East Japan earthquake of those who could be identified, almost 1,000 plus were female compared to the number of male casualties that were recorded. However, this is not to say that this is a, a straitjacket rule for all disasters. We have a few disasters where men have in fact died more than women in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. One of the examples is from the 1919 Hurricane Mitch in Central America with these numbers that you can see on your screen and similarly close to home, the 2018 Kerala floods. So what was different here? What was different was that women are risk averse and men are socially expected to be taken the lead in rescue operations. So these kind of uh, gendered social expectations do play a huge role when it comes to the effects of disasters on men and women. At the same time, while we speak about men and women, we also have to stay mindful of the other gendered minorities because they already face a number of challenges because of their identity and during disasters, they become worse. So when we address gender concerns, we are speaking about allocating of resources to address these issues, but more significantly, rather than just speaking about giving a certain budget line for gender issues, is that we also have to speak about redistributing the power in participatory decision-making so that there can be strategic policy shifts. This is what we mean when we say a rights-based approach has to be applied so that there can be structural so that it's not a quick fix that every time there's a disaster, we set aside this much money for the women and children. That is not how it should work. But it should be more of a, a mix of a top-down and a bottom approach. So disaster risk reduction that focuses on gender equality is cost-effective because it also reduces vulnerability while addressing the need for sustainable livelihoods. And when you address the concern of women, invariably, it moves up the entire community. Now, what I'll do next is make a case of gender mainstreaming by taking you through the different stages of disasters. Let's start with pre-disaster, the mitigation and preparedness. One of the often touted and useful measures to address disasters before they happen is to raise public awareness. So when we do this, and when we look at through a gender lens, two main things we have to consider is that women do play a very significant role as informal teachers, because what they imbibe in this public event is raising, they take back home, they speak amongst themselves. Due to social restrictions and cultural norms, not all women are allowed outside. So, but when they do go out, they become informal teachers for these communities, which may not be accessible otherwise. But while we do expect women to have this unique capacity, we also have to be mindful that they already carry a very heavy domestic workload, which in many communities are not equitably shared in the household. And another thing, vulnerability within high-risk communities. And when we speak about this, like I mentioned earlier, there are multiple vulnerabilities a person may face, regardless of their gender. And we have to be cognizant of these social inequities so that we can address their concerns. The next is knowledge management. And when I speak about knowledge management, I'm not just speaking about maintaining a database, but this starts from the very beginning, which is collecting this uh, sex desegregated data, but also the way in which we collect data. It has to be, again, cognizant of the cultural norms of an area so that you can be effective in your data collection and how you need the information you've collected and the media narrative on the data that you've collected. All of this do have impacts on how the mitigation and preparedness of a community is prior to a disaster. And this can be achieved through effective participation in the decision-making process within a community. 
And this can be done by increasing the capacity of the people through trainings or through other public awareness campaigns. And this necessarily required a specific budgeting for these issues because you cannot expect to just take off some money. But when you do budget it for all of your major programs, it does make it easier. But having said that, what we generally do find is that when we speak about gender budgeting, we just find a line for women and children, while child rearing is a very significant part of womanhood in most cultures around the world. It is not the only indicator of womanhood. So when we speak about gender budgeting, equal consideration has to be given to the many roles that women play in our societies and not just child, child rearing. Now, the next thing is uh, rescue and relief. Here, one of the most important one is the early warning systems. The 1990 cyclone I mentioned earlier, when 91% of the women died, one of the major reasons for the increased casualty among women was that the early warning signals went to the men and they were not accessible to the women who found themselves trapped. Another reason we find this mostly in South Asian communities, not to say this doesn't have happened elsewhere, but definitely in our part of the globe, is that the adaptive capacity of women when it comes in terms of their mobility is severely restricted because of their because of the social may i please request whoever that is to mute your mic please and the other reason is the adaptive capacity in terms of mobility is mentioning is that women are not in some areas of the world socially expected to climb trees or swim now these have severe consequences if you look at the 2004 tsunami in sri lanka Many of the women died because they felt, or they were severely injured because they felt uneasy swimming or disrobing so that they can save themselves from the waves. Another important thing is resource distribution. How this comes into places like in camps where there is already a scarcity of resources, the nutritional needs of women take a backseat. And because of the circumstances, the infections and these things have to be looked at from a gender perspective because women already feel less secure in these kind of closed spaces. And this inevitably leads, leads to a heightened risk of violence. Now, when we come to the post-disaster phase, which is focused on rehabilitation and restoration, we find that there's a disproportionate increase in the burden of work. This is primarily because women are the main caregivers and they care for the children, the elderly who are injured. And women are also engaged in a lot of community organizing and mobilizing in the immediate aftermath. And they are the ones who primarily then go into productive work in the informal sector, which is not as secure as the opportunities they have in the formal sector. This also leads to a lot of migration of the male family members, which then again leads to an increase in female head households, who then have to face the added already existing issues of lack to access of credit and resources that women face in most communities. One of the ways for addressing this is community-based disaster risk reduction. And how this does is by addressing this culture and institutional barriers from the very beginning. So previously I mentioned that it can be a top-down and a bottom-up approach and community-based disaster risk reduction is a bottom-up approach where it is very viable to gender mainstream our issues. So when you address these cultural norms and the institutional barriers in place. This can be done by integrating the voices of the marginalized communities. And when you speak of the marginalized, again, we have to be very mindful of the complexities of intersectional vulnerabilities. And all of this will then translate into a more equitable natural resource and risk management from the, from the bottom up, so that this will then inform the, the local development plans and adaptation plans that are developed through these uh, methods. Now let's come let's come to the climate change adaptation. The sensitivity relevant in climate change adaptation. Because women are often poorer, they receive less education, are excluded from a lot of the decision-making processes that affect their life. These have very real consequences with the rapid approach and the rapid increase of climate change events that we see around the globe. So let me just take you through a few of the thematic areas to give you a glimpse into what this means in each of these areas. So when we speak about agriculture and food security, 
we find that women tend to depend more largely on traditional food sources, and this means that they need access to land. But with the degrading environment, the access to land that they did have previously becomes not reliable because of the quality of the land. And this in turn also affects the nutritional needs of the women themselves, of the people in their family. Another aspect is biodiversity. And this is what one of the areas that Dr. Murli was referring to earlier is ecosystem-based adaptation measures. Uh, in the case of climate change adaptation and ecosystem-based disaster risk reductions, essentially we use the ecosystem to our advantage and help us in adapting to these changes, mitigating the changes where that is the only solution that we have. Now we can use our biodiversity. So this would mean using um, mangroves in coastal areas. It could also mean using planting um, drought-resistant crops in place the places that are drought-prone. So what this translates into is the material welfare of the people and also the sustainability of the livelihoods that they choose. And like we saw previously in the immediate aftermath of disasters, women lose their livelihoods more than men do. And women have lesser options of migrating away from home to find other livelihood options as well. Another one of the significant impacts that we see in terms of gender when it climbs to climate change is the scarcity of freshwater sources that women face. And women are primarily the managers of household water, so to speak, and they travel long distances, which every day in some cases where they lose their opportunity, their time to go for further education. So they are trapped patient they began in or even worse off than they were. This has severe impacts on their health because prolonged exposure to the scorching heat does cause a significant um, number of diseases which they are then not capable of addressing because of the many other burdens that they have to bear. And because of environmental degradation, we also have migration patterns which are visible. And th these migrations can be both internal and also cross-border. But when you look at it from a gender perspective, you see that the impacts are quite different depending on the socioeconomic status of the men and the women who are migrating and the behavioral restrictions generally on women and the information, again, generally that women have to face. There are, again, implications for human security, and this is issues that everyone face, but are exacerbated when you're a woman in the circumstances. Hunger, malnutrition, exposure to diseases is, do affect both men and women, but women more severely than men. Now, one of the very significant points that I do want to emphasize here is energy. So when we speak about energy, we tend to think about the more, the, the bigger picture, which is, you know, the renewables versus the, the non-renewables. But before we go into that, when we look at it from a very, from the gender lens, we have to look at what women deal with more generally on a day-to-day -day basis. And we find that, especially in the least developing countries, Traditional biomass fuels such as wood, charcoal, and agricultural waste are mostly dealt with by women. And when they are then excluded, these conversations around energy policy, we find that when the community might be able to go ahead with more renewable and more cleaner sources of energy, when we have the domestic use of these resources, this biomass fuels, it then creates a certain um, inertia, in a sense, to going in the right direction. And this can be addressed by bringing women to the table where they can also discuss why this is what they prefer to do or why this is the only thing they can do. These conversations have to start at a very basic level. Not everything can just be about science because science, but science will not always address these issues at their core if the people do not have a voice at the table. Many of these issues that women face or other vulnerable groups face, they are best understood coming from there, from them, so that the narrative that they do present before us does not get skewed for any other reason. Which is why when we think about women as agents of change, rather than just as vulnerable groups, it is important what we focus on also be how they can assist in mitigation and adaptation practices. And when we speak about the technology transfer that is required for this mitigation adaptation practices, 
we take into consideration the gender gap in education access, income, and the time they have to put towards this mitigation and adaptation methods. So when we speak about technology in this context, we are not referring to information technology alone. Technology can also be knowledge, processes, activities, and also the context in which they function, which is sociocultural and political. And the knowledge can also be traditional knowledge because it has been found in certain cases that the traditional knowledge, which is generally for of the, of the household has helped in situations to address immediate need, especially in the immediate aftermath of a flood. For example, in Fiji, there was an instance soon after one of their of the cyclones that the women were able to find the fresh water source which the men couldn't because that was traditionally passed in their households so these things are very not, they are not necessarily um very big in the lot in the larger scheme of things but they do make a huge difference in terms of how a community itself can become more resilient in the face of disasters and changing climate this, it is necessary that women also be empowered. And for this, financial initiative, financing initiatives are very necessary. And for that, access to funds, which are aimed at covering weather related losses, are very significant. We do have, in India at least, we have a significant number of um, initiatives where women are given precedence and access to funds. But the question then is what happens when then? during a disaster, they are not able to pay back, do they then fall into a debt cycle? Our policies also need to address what happens in such situations and how we can safeguard the interest of women who are then the primary lend lenders in these kind of situations. So we come to how we can make climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction gender responsive. The most important thing is to identify the gaps in our existing policy responses and strategies and then to formulate policy responses and strategies which address these gaps and can strengthen existing institutions to address these challenges. Our main focus should be on building resilience and addressing the underlying vulnerability. And this includes both acknowledging that climate change and disasters Force, they perpetuate and they do increase gender inequities and that women contributions greatly enhance adaptation reduction. It is not that women are just vulnerable, but they, are, they also have unique capabilities in terms of addressing this, especially at the community level. To translate that into action, it is really important that there is an equitable participation of women. And here I do not use the word equal, because oftentimes equal is insufficient. It has to be equitable and it has to be proper participation. It has to be meaningful participation. Best way to do this is that to make our policies vigorous, they have to be pro because they are the more vulnerable and more affected group and also gender sensitive in our planning for the needs. That brings us to the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. And if there is something I'm not able to answer right now, I, please feel free to reach out to me and I can get back to you with a more detailed response. Thank you. Over to you, Murli. Thank you, Devsri, for this <clears throat> aspect of disaster, which, which is mostly not covered. Incidentally, the post-disaster needs assessment from Kerala was considered a very good practice in terms of mainstreaming gender in this um, aspect. We have a number of questions um, which has come. I think there will be a lot more questions than we can answer immediately. But I wanted to ask um, Dr. James if he has picked up some questions or should we pick up some questions? Dr. James? Yes, sir. Only we have already selected some questions of Dr. Emia who would uh, okay. announce it. Dr. Emia, what will be? Um, good morning, sir. Good morning, yes. Uh, yes, sir. I have picked up some couple of questions, so I will just um, read it to you. Uh, yeah. Maybe one, one of the questions is that uh, uh, in spite of almost 20 years of disaster management authority and related acts in India, I still have not come across any sort of local planning. 
um, so how this can be made a part of the system it's being asked by one of the uh, participants um, sir please thank you you know this is a very uh, uh, important question because we believe and we advocate across the world that the most sustainable uh, solution to disaster and the biggest foundation for sustainable development is planning land use but this is easier said than done and particularly so in kerala where land is not just an instrument of production but is also a means of investment so if one were to say that there will be some restriction on their land use it will be vehemently as well as violently resisted by the community you know the case of uh, gadgil commission report which at the bottom uh, if you strip out every environmental aspect the bottom line of that is that it would have put a planning requirement in place which would have restricted the use of land which people had and this is exactly the case with the paddy and wetland act in the, the midlands of kerala and the coastal regulation zone in the coastal areas so the community is directly impacted by the efforts of planning while everybody agree that planning is a good idea when it start to have a direct impact on their life their property and in a way their financial resources they would start to resist so while you, one could argue that this lack of planning from the, the government which is leading to the problem my take on this is that that doesn't happen because there is no political consensus at this point and it will be politically very risky for any administration to initiate comprehensive land use planning thank you there was there was one question i don't know if you saw it this was the question was the following what is that is needed more to address the gender issues which you mentioned is it more awareness or more resources there was your your take thank you i because awareness without resources do not translate into action and without the proper awareness required as to how to utilize them and who to involve decision making involved in how to utilize these resources would also be redundant and would just be another action taken on paper so which is why it's really important that we encourage and seek for communities with women definitely to have a more effective participation in the decisions because the decisions has to happen at every level when we speak about disaster when it has to be pre disaster during disaster post disaster and we speak about climate change mitigation adaptation measures even there we have to take into consideration the specific vulnerabilities and the adaptation capacity that women play a part in their society so if we focus on awareness raising without providing the resources it would not mean anything really at the end of the day but if you just provide a budget line saying this is for women's needs without describing how it is to be used that is also in my opinion very redundant and a uh, waste of the resources have been allocated thank you that's it ramya ah uh, yes sir so shall we take other questions couple of questions more or yes please ah uh, okay sir uh, another one from one of the participants uh, which natural based solutions are suitable to reduce the impact of landslides in kerala thank you landslides um, in kerala um, would be for a number of reasons and you should not assume that a solution will solve all landslides in kerala but clearly if you are undercutting a hill for building a road or if you are blasting a quarry on the on the top then clearly you are increasing the chances 
of creating that disaster. So the first solution is land use planning so that you do not plan these type of activities which increase the disasters to begin with. Second point is about having a well vegetated land and a well drainaged land as well. So in Davos, while what you see is the protection forest, below the protection forest, there are also a series of streams which has been not really opened up, but well maintained. The streams are always there, but well maintained so that whenever there is rain, the water can rapidly rush down the hill rather than sinking into the hill and creating flood. So tree, planting trees as well as having drainage system is a nice way solution. The third point is that when you say planting tree uh, or planting vegetation is a more appropriate word, you should also remember what type of things you do. For example, vetiver grass is a very appropriate and proper way of retaining soil. And it grows very fast. But vetiver grass is also very valuable as a source of um, raw material for making oil. Now, if you start to plant and then pull it out every other year, then of course you are increasing the chance. Anytime you are planting a short term crop, such as tapioca, while it might look green, or rubber, which is every 16 years, while it might look green, it is causing trouble in the long term. So there is a lot you have to do in terms of land use planning, in terms of drainage control, vegetation, but also in terms of water, what type of vegetation you use. Thank you. We have time for one more question and other questions we can answer online because we have a video coming up to be included. So if there's a question to Devasri, you can ask. Thank you. Um, okay, sir. I think uh, that well, the one question related to gender issue was being asked by sir to Devasri, ma'am. Um, I didn't find any other question related to gender issue. Um, but I think um, one is related to uh, Kuchin International Airport. Like uh, uh, it's been asked that um, CL seems to have implemented a very effective and smart way in preventing airport from flooding. What is your take on it? Can this be implemented or developed to other parts as well? So uh, I think that's one relevant issue. So maybe, sir, you can answer on it. Thank you. Um, CL, as you know, is um, planned in a floodplain. Even before the flooding happened in 2018, um, we knew that this place is going to be flooded. And the, fl the place will be flooded again and again. And the, as the climate change increases, there will be more floods in that area. So to avoid flooding in CL is impossible. That's, that's not going to happen. What you can have, do is to reduce the impact of floods now that CL is there. And I think this is, it. You now you're talking about these measures. And now that the airport is there, of course, they have no other choice. The, the challenge of using similar measures elsewhere is that the type of revenue which CL has and the type of opportunity cost CL has of the, that much land, let's say 1,000 hectares, being flooded for two days, it will cost you know many tens of crores of rupees, which is not the same if you had another paddy field flooded for two days. So the amount of investment you can make is not similar. So while we do appreciate the amount of investment they have made, and it is certainly making an impact, in the long run, I think the right solution is that when you plan your airports and other infrastructure, then you look for a place where it is not in an active floodplain. Thank you. Dr. James, we now have a video from Karen, which you could um, present. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. That is going to be a 